What's going on YouTube? This is Necrostevo, and it's time for our Eternity Enders team draft analysis for Season 3 of the Pokemon Premier League. Um, if you did not see Season 2, where I was very cordially invited to play and fill in a slot there, had a lot of fun, had a lot of hacks, but mostly had a lot of fun. Um, Shoutouts to the Don Fanatic and Ryquin, of course, for having me in the first place. And, of course, I've been asked back again for Season 3. Um, if you'll ignore the birds chirping in the background, I did not hit my head on anything. But what is important is that we're in a new season. That means we get a brand new team. Uh, and we have some new people to go up against. Um, I just wanted to bring up the first little screen here for you all. You can see all the different teams competing. And you can have all their Twitters on the screen for you. Of course, for any of the battles that I have, I'll be linking their channels and Twitters and all that good stuff in the description anyway. But it's nice to just see not only do we have a lot of teams returning, such as the Bayern Munich or the uh, the Norwich Giddy, we also have the Pittsburgh Power, the Portland Timbers coming back, Paris Saint Germain with Shroom River. All those teams are coming back. And we have some new core teams as well that I'm really looking forward to battling because who doesn't like new rivals? Uh, so let's just get on to the draft, of course. For those of you who don't know how it works, in the Pokemon Premier League, all Pokemon are assigned a value which was predetermined by uh, Raikwin and, and uh, Don Fanatic and several other of the creators of the, of the league. And you are given 110 million, and this they raised it because some new Pokemon were raised in the value, and, and so it was just a little bit more fun overall to have that extra 10 million. Last season we had 100 million. And you, are, have, you have to do your entire pick based on, not only do you have to have at least eight Pokemon, but you also have to stay within those parameters. Otherwise, you can draft whatever you want. You can only get one Mega. And of course, the Mega is separate from the actual Pokemon in this league, so one person could draft the Mega. Another person could still draft the regular Pokemon. Uh, this is the first league that I participated in that has allowed uh, Mega Latio. So that was drafted pretty quickly. Um, you can kind of just get a good idea of the team values overall just on the sidebar there. But uh, I, I was very pleased with the values. I thought some things were nicely undervalued, uh, while some things were overvalued. And the, the draft direction that I wanted to take my draft in, which I actually planned out beforehand pretty succinctly with my co-coach Aqua Cluncher. Of course, you can find his Twitter link in the description as well, because he'll be helping me out with a lot of the planning and such for different matches when I don't have enough time or when I just want a second opinion. Uh, he has some really good ideas, but going into this, I really wanted to use a Mega Pokemon that I had not used before. So my entire draft was actually built around Mega Obama Snow. Um, I did not want Mega Obama Snow for my first pick because I believe that he, number one, wouldn't be likely to be picked. And number two, I think if I picked him too early, that would make other people worry about uh, the wrong types of threats with my team. And then that's when you get into the situation of counter picks and people picking up things that they think that you'll need. So, going into this draft, my first um, goal was to get Clefable. Clefable not only gets Magic Guard, uh, it's worth a whopping 18 uh, million, so that means it's definitely highly valued. That's the, high, the only thing higher than that, I think, is 19 million, as far as the valuations on the table. And so, that just really tells you about its versatility. Now, I did use Clefable before, and the... Um, Indigo League of Legends in the very first season of that, so you guys are no stranger to how I like to use Clefable. But that, my usage with it there really only scratched the surface of how versatile it is. Also very notably with Magigar, it is immune to the Hailstorm that is summoned by Obama Snow, and so I get some nice energy there. While also Clefable is able to switch in on a lot of the things that threaten Obama Snow, but then it also introduced a very annoying uh, dual steel type weakness into the team. So with that steel type weakness, the second pick was very important because it was a snake draft, and so, uh, if you don't know what a snake draft is, it would move down the line from 1 all the way up to 12, I think there are 12 teams? Yes, 1 to 12. So RTK got the last pick in the first round, but then he immediately got to pick a second Pokemon, so he went Melodic and then Shaman, and then the draft moved all the way back. And so by the time that second draft pick swung around to me, I actually had gotten sniped already, because I was planning on getting Starmie. Uh, the FC Volcarona definitely sniped me there, but that wasn't my second pick. That was actually my uh, fourth pick, I believe, after Mega Obama Snow. So I got sniped right there, which is a little bit unfortunate. But I didn't get sniped on Caesar, which is really, really important for my th uh, draft. Uh, Caesar gives me much needed priority, 
it basically seals up the steel type weakness that I have between Mega Obama Snow and Clefable. And it also gives me a way to get rid of hazards because the team that I planned on drafting, hazards were going to be an issue. There was really no way around that. So I wanted to have a couple different ways to get rid of it. We'll talk more about that later. Um, furthermore, I have several different Caesar sets bred so I don't run into the crunch of breeding different Caesar as well. Also finding and stealing Metacolts from uh, Skarmory is annoying. Um, so with that, I knew I wanted Mega Obama Snow to be my um, third pick. I think I just said Obama Snow. I, I don't know why I said that. Uh, got sniped once again um, coming back towards me there, but that's okay. I ended up going with Chandelure. I, my original pick for that fire slot was actually Arcanine, and so the Pittsburgh Pyroar sniped me coming back there, so that means coming back into my turn I got sniped twice, which was unfortunate, but that's why it is important to have backups. Chandelure was my number one fire backup. It has really good synergy with the Bomba Snow, with the Bomba Snow being weak to fire and also being um, weak to fighting. Chandelure is immune to fire and fighting, so the only reason I like Arcanine over that is because Arcanine had priority shenanigans to use, but Chandelure is an excellent secondary pick. I don't feel like I got sniped too badly right there. Um, it was also really, really nice to pick up Slow King, uh, Chandelure and Slow King together there. Again, synergy is important, but even better here, that gives me the option to use Trick Room. Slow King is the type of Pokemon that is bulky enough so that it needs to be prepared for, but at the same token, I think a lot of people sleep on it because it's not Slowbro. And I could have gotten Slowbro here. I don't think Slowbro went until much later on in the draft. But I wanted Slow King just because it synergized a little bit better, not only offensively, but setting up Trick Room. It's a little bit easier, I think, with Slowbro. And uh, with Slow King, excuse me, I think with Slowbro, more people are prepared to face the face Slowbro than they are to face Slow King. Um, sorry, Kelly, for sniping Slow King from you. Uh, I will be naming at least one of them Gomen for my penance. Now, with those first picks there, when I stopped at Slow King, I had basically only gotten sniped on Starmie and Arcanine. I did go Slow King like I wanted to do. And so after that, my draft really became a lot more flexible depending on what other people were drafting. Um, my initial pick with Pangoro right here, you can see I was picking a little bit more highly valued Pokemon and then I got Pangoro right in the middle of my draft. I needed a fighting type and I needed a dark type, but I needed them to be, if I needed them to use in Trick Room, I needed to use them there, but it also needed to be something that got access to Gunk Shot, and I hate Conkledur, so I didn't want Conkledur. Uh, and that's when Pangoro came up. Pangoro is very, very unique, having access to not only Iron Fist, but it gets scrappy, so that means it can blow make a Sableye back very easily, which up until I picked uh, Pangoro, I kind of had issues with Mega Sableye, honestly. Uh, but I, I really like Pangoro kind of gluing the team together somewhat here. Alongside Caesar, he also gives me a nice little uh, momentum switch with Parting Shot, so that's nice too. Uh, Pangoro gets a, a lot of nice coverage options, including Gunk Shot and Rock Coverage. I could also use Ice Punch with him if I needed to, so I like that. Uh, my next pick being Zagard, um, that was a little bit weird too. I believe I got sniped there. Where did I get sniped at here? Where was it at? Where were you at? Ah, there you are. There it is with RTK and the Portland Timbers. I originally wanted Gudra for that slot, but that actually worked out okay because Zagard had a lower overall point value as far as the money being spent on it. They're both worth 13, but I think for my, the way that I value the Pokemon, Zagard was a better, uh, utility for my team. Um, he's a little bit more flexible than Gudra, and his typing was a little bit better for the team than pure dragon. Um, I didn't have anything to come in on electric types up until this point, and now I have something that can completely block Volt Switch, so very, very nice there. My next pick was actually an accident. I, I, I um, didn't mean to necessarily pick up Rotom Wash. I was asking if it were still available, and I ended up with it which worked out because I had Rotom Wash slashed alongside a few other things. I didn't get a chance to give a Porygon because I was sniped much earlier on by um, 
I think Unlawful Exile ended up sniping him. Yes. So he got Vaporeon significantly earlier on, so I knew that I'd have to pick up something else there. But I, the reason I wanted Vaporeon originally was just to have a Cleric and Wish Passer for the team. Plus Vaporeon doesn't really um, sleep on the offensive side having a nice base special attack. You can't just switch into it as easily as you could uh, something a little bit more um, passive. Uh, a lot of bulky water types are very passive, but I didn't want something like that. And so that's how I ended up with Rotom Wash, which I actually have never used in League format before. And back in 5th gen, I hated Rotom Wash. So it's interesting coming back around to Rotom Wash. You guys know if you've watched my battles, I don't really use Rotom Wash. So this will be interesting to use it. Having nice um, synergy, being able to beat a lot of the things that Caesar can't muscle through. Uh... That's where Rotom Wash comes in. You also get a nice bulky pivot if you need it. It can throw up screens. It can. I have un, a secondary Willow Whisper here. Uh, trick user with Scarf. Having some some possibilities between Slow King um, and Rotom Wash, like a slow Volt Switcher type thing. I don't know. I have some possibilities there. Uh, also, be, with Levitate means that I'm not gonna be too worried about toxic spikes and such on the ground. And that's when we came to the last pick. The reason that Rotom Wash was a mistake is because if I had gotten something a little bit cheaper, then I could have gotten Espeon, which was my original choice for that last slot. But since I spent a little bit more than I expected to on Rotom Wash, I ended up with Zatu, which is completely okay. I wanted Espeon mainly for Magic Bounce and the Clerical reasons that I was getting Vaporeon for originally. But since I have Zatu, I still get all the um, Magic Bounce support. And I s also, uh, the, the differences there really are the typing. Espeon has much better speed and special attack, but uh, its move pool is really, really shallow as far as offensive options go. Whereas Zatu still has a relatively shallow move pool, gives access to Tailwind, U-Turn. Uh, it can still wish, which is the most important thing. Zatu gets wished by level up, so I definitely want to, to take note of that. But... Uh, it can set up a little bit differently from Espeon. I think that it threatens differently, and it gives me some some flying type coverage if I need to use Air Slash for something, whereas Espeon, I don't get that extra coverage with. So I was completely okay with that. I didn't feel like I necessarily um, misspoke there or anything. I just thought that it was funny that I ended up with Rotom Wash when that wasn't my original uh, plan. So that's the team, the Eterna City Enders for this season of uh, the Pokemon Premier League. Let me know what you think of the team overall. I'm very, very, very pleased with this. I some of these I've used a lot of these Pokemon before. The only Pokemon here that I don't have a lot of experience with, I think, is Rotom Wash. That's the only Pokemon I haven't really used much, uh, which is funny because it's almost always in the top ten of OU. I just don't like it that much. I think Rotom Leaf uh, Mower Form is a lot cooler. But anyways, uh. Uh, just let me know what you think of the team. Really quick, we're going to run down the other teams and throw out some threats that I see. We're just going to go in order of the draft order. Um, up first is Shoddy with the Baron Munich. His very first pick with, was Manaphy. Talk about a power pick. I really thought that the between him and Unlawful Exile, the first two picks being Pixie Pokemon, really, really demonstrates the effectiveness of having just a monotype, base 100 stats across the board, very effective move pool. You don't need much for Manaphy to be effective. Now that being said, Manaphy can't really do much against Mega Abomasnow, so I really like that. Uh, and Mega Abomasnow even shuts down the, the hydration rest set, so good on you Mega Abomasnow. Really, really like his choices to go with Crobat and then Aromatisse. Fairies are kind of a... Um, they're a commodity in, in this format, and... I like his choice of going with Aromatisse early on, because with Manaphy and Crobat, his, and then even with Thunderous T, uh, that's getting really, really speedy, and so that means Trick Room can really shut him down, but with Aromatisse in there, you really have to make your opponent pump the brakes and make sure that they're not giving you a huge advantage by using Aromatisse. Uh, Dredagon, I forgot to talk about Dredagon, Oh man. So I actually got sniped in Dredagon too, because that was my secondary choice after Gudra went away. But Dredagon was my second choice, and then I fill in Zagard. So Dredagon would have been really, really nice on my team, um, especially in Trick Room. But a bulky pivot is just basically what I wanted. But I wanted Dredagon for more of the rough skin just to punish people for using U-Turn. So missed out on that there. But I see Shoddy definitely making good use of that. Um, after Dredagon, his 
his picks get really bulky and annoying. Seismitoad and Skuntank back to back. Not really fun. Um, Seismitoad, fortunately, not something that my team is very worried about. Skuntank can be very annoying for my team. Threatening Clefable, it gets fire type coverage. It can hit Mega Obama Snow. Um, it can trap Chandelure and Slow King. So I don't really want to deal with Skuntank. Never mind the fact that it can spray its stinky spray over the size of a football field. Like, that's just nothing that anyone wants to really deal with. Uh, pouring on to Vanillox and Girafferig. Very, very, very interesting choices. I'm looking forward to seeing how he will use Girafferig because that's a Pokemon that is very flexible, but in standard play, it's basically outclassed. In a league format, it allows you to really cater it towards what are the holes that you need to plug in your team. Because Giraffe Rig not only has very unique typing, uh, but also it gets a very broad move pool. So I'm interested to see what he does there. And of course Mega Lopunny. I was surprised that it went so late in the draft. Mega Lopunny is normally a much more um, polarizing choice where people jump on it immediately. But I used Mega Lopunny before. I only hope that I don't have to go up against Focus Punching Mega Lopunny because I know that it hits hard. And while I don't have any ghost types, my main way of resisting Mega Lopunny is either Clefable or Zatu, and even they don't like taking repeated hits from it. So looking forward to battling Shadi. Definitely a very efficient draft. He had no funds left over. He had the maximum amount of slots used, so I see that there was a lot of planning there. The second draft choice here with the uh, Unlawful Exile. First of all, just props for picking Mega Venusaur. Someone has to. I, I think every time I don't use Mega Venusaur myself, it helps me kind of grow a little bit as a trainer because I know how good Mega Venusaur is. I know how awesome my favorite Pokemon is. So, uh, already, props. Now, with that first choice being Mew alongside Mega Venusaur, that's a very interesting choice. And then you have Mamoswine. You kind of see him build again. Some defensive choices here because those are some of the things that threaten Mega Venusaur. Um, furthermore, Staraptor, another Pokemon that threatens Mega Venusaur alongside later on Alakazam. These are all things that Mega Venusaur doesn't like to t face. And when they're on the same side as Mega Venusaur, you have a very big threat factor there. Now for the first few of his several choices there, he, he 18, 17, 16, 14, and 14, those are all really, really highly valued picks, interestingly. Uh, even on Shadi's pick, by the time we got down to round um, five or so, he had dipped down into picking a little bit lower valued Pokemon. So he definitely came out swinging. Similar to me, he only went with eight Pokemon overall. Um, even Hitmonchan, I think, is undervalued here. He really, really liked a spinner, obviously. I don't know if Hitmonchan is the best spinner for his team, but it, with the fighting stab and it also gives him priority, that is what really benefits his team. Uh, Galvantula is another interesting choice just because it slows things down. His team's not very slow, though. Between Alakazam, uh, Star Raptor, and I think the slowest thing that he has overall is probably Hitmonchan. Um, so his team's not very slow, so it'll be very easy for him to take advantage of Sticky Web if he needs to. Uh, the worst thing here really is the access to a lot of different varied options. Like he has three or four Pokemon that could be Scarfed, he has three or four Pokemon that could be Specs. Um, some Pokemon, he even has Mew, which is something that is really hard to prepare for because you never know what they're going to bring on it. So, going to be interesting to prepare for that. Now, number three, Don Fanatic definitely knows what he's doing when it comes to drafting formats. And that is definitely apparent here with his first pick being Mega Latios. The league voted and we all decided, hey, we'll allow Mega Latios. And he immediately pounced on that. Not looking forward to facing it. Fortunately, we have Clefable because Mega Latios can't do much to Clefable. But uh, if he happens to break down Clefable with, say, Zoroark or Nidoking or uh, Darmanitan, all these Pokemon that can muscle through Clefable or use poison type coverage, eh, then we'll be in a little bit of trouble. Um, also, annoyingly, he has Skarmory and Florges for a very, very nice defensive core. Um, kind of rounded out a little bit by Gastrodon. I really like choosing Skarmory and Floor just that early on. Again, I like seeing fairy picks in the first few picks because they're so hard to get later on. And then having a fairy pick followed by a steel type, or in this case he did it in, the, in, re, in reverse, really allows me to understand where the person's head at when the drafting goes. Now in particular, I don't like Zoroark here on this team because it's so annoying. 
Zoroark can be masked as Darmanitan in U-Turn. Zoroark gets a lot of the same coverage options as Nidoking, so it can use those options as Nidoking, and I won't know that it's a Zoroark until it's too late. Uh, so that might be annoying. For, uh, and then furthermore, he has a lot of uh, Volt Switch U-Turn that he can do here. Um, Zoroark gets U-Turn, Helios gets Volt Switch, Darmanitan gets U-Turn. I, I just don't want to deal with all that momentum. He has too much momentum, it's too good. Um, and then having Darmanitan, how did Darmanitan stick around for that long? That Pokemon hits really, really hard. Don't want to deal with it. And then on top of that, we have Hitmon Lee. Uh, I think a, a team like this kind of does struggle against something like what, uh, Unlawful Exile drafted just because of the speed control that Unlawful Exile has. But that's where the Dawn Fanatic can really just overwhelm you with the pure amount of power that he's using. It's really um, great coverage, great amount of power, very, very difficult to plan for. Now the fourth pick overall was Shroom Raver at the Parasect Germain. Right after we saw Mega Latios get drafted, I was expecting, okay, what next powerhouse is going to be drafted? And then we see Latios, which is interesting. Uh, once again, we see Dragon, Fairy, Steel. I am liking that so much. It, and not just any Fairy, of course, it's Sylveon. And then I was actually uh, surprised to see Mega Scizor chosen this early, which is unfortunate because that means I have to go up against it. But it's really, really bad because uh, Sylveon and Mega Scizor complement each other really, really well. It's a lot of offensive pressure that can be applied just in those two Pokemon. Um, and when you add into it the the defensive pressure that can be taken away from something like Weezing or even Jellicent, which is a very, very squishy Pokemon, and they the def defensive synergy is pretty nice there too. Um, so not something that's easy to prepare for. Furthermore, Shroom Raver used up all the slots, so again we have that, that slot syndrome of what are they really going to bring, having to figure out the six that they're going to use out of all of those Pokemon. Now some really interesting choices here with Tangela and Noctowl. Um, I really like Noctowl. Noctowl especially in this type of format. A lot of people don't understand how well it can take specially based hits. And um, also it's an owl. Who doesn't like owls? Owls are cool. Their heads can rotate really far around without them killing themselves. So that's that's really cool. Uh, Tangela also gives them a really annoying um, regenerator pivot. And with Eviolite it can take hits a little bit better than Tangrowth, so I'm um, going to have to be relying on Knockoff to handle that. Uh, you don't see a lot of people drafting Tornadus Eye in different formats, but here the Prankster is really nice because this team is actually relatively mediocre speed. Um, so outside of, I think his fastest thing that he has is Tornadus Eye and then Latia, so not, not overly speedy, but definitely with that speed being lost, he does get a lot more bulk out of it. Um, we're going to skip my draft because I already talked about it and move on to uh, Frank C. Trode who of course coaches the FC Volcarona several snipes in his team rawr my girlfriend of course will be happy to see that he drafted Spinda but with that uh, Spinda is not to be slept on ladies and gentlemen the ability contrary allows him to switch in on something like uh, the, the sticky web from Galvantula that we saw earlier and get a speed boost then he uses superpower then he has an attack and defense boost suddenly now you have something that's relatively difficult to break through so that is pretty annoying on top of that he's the one who snipes Garmy for me so dang it Starmy you're on another team this time but that is all right uh, once again fairy picks in the very first rounds with Mega Gardevoir Mega Gardevoir is going to be relatively annoying for my team to take on because a single Mega Gardevoir with the right coverage can break through seven of my Pokemon, depending on what type of coverage it runs. Fortunately, as long as I figure out the coverage option, I can take it on with different things. And at the end of the day, I can always bullet punch it in the face with Caesar. Uh He does have some great synergy with Mega Gardevoir with Cobalion, and to a lesser extent, um, the uh, Rotom Mo form. Just because Cobalion, of course, being weak to ground and fighting, and then Mega Gardevoir and Rotom not really caring about fighting or ground for Rotom. Really, really nice there. And we see some Volts with shenanigans once again, and even Golbat can use U turn. So there are several things to be worried about on his team. Uh, very interesting, I think, more of a defensive pick 
with Stoutland, of course, you can use uh, Sand Rush Stoutland, so that's something that all the teams are going to have to prepare for. Some type of speed control, just being aware that at any point, Waffles of Stoutland might jump in and blow you back. And I got, I already, I already showed you guys what happens when you when you don't like waffles. They come into the battle and they destroy you. What happens if you don't like pancakes? They come into the battle and they destroy you. We're not even going to talk about French toast at this point. So just be aware that he has Hippowdon and Stoutland. Um, and you can't even just throw Scalds blindly at his team, which is really important here because the only other thing that he has to take uh, water type moves on something that doesn't really mind getting burned is Starmie because it has natural cure. Well, the Polyrath around, you can't do that. It just gets water absorbed and then sets up in your face. Not fun. He can also set up with Snorlax, and that really hampers teams that might try to run something like Trick Room. Um, Snorlax loves Trick Room, and it just loves to sit in there, curse up, and then completely heal its HP with rest. So, several threats in this team. Yet another really, really efficient draft using all the money and all the slots. Really impressive. Now, up next, we have Fufu and the Mewcastle United, one of the new teams in Division 1 for this season, so congratulations. And first pick, once again, first three rounds, Steel-type and a Fairy-type. I'm just, every time I hear that in my head, I'm just going to slap an air horn button, and it's just going to go, burr, 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 burr. we have the chosen one here. But I really, really like this draft. Number one, Drachi, Nidoqueen, Togekiss. Those first three picks are indicative of an understanding of not only adapting the draft um jirachi is a uh, again we see the the fairy the excuse me the pixie pick in the first slot 100 stats across the board highly versatile um can go defensive offensive scarf banded specs even it can set up it can support it's it's similar to picking Mew on your first slot so i really like that but then with that his other choices augment Jirachi so that not only does it get proper support, but then you're not forcing Jirachi into doing all the roles all the time. Nidoqueen can also set up different types of entry hazards, and it also gets different coverage from Jirachi, because Jirachi's coverage is really, really nice. Nidoqueen's coverage, also fantastic, plus they're both very bulky. Uh, you also get some pretty good defensive synergy there, although they are both weak to ground, and that's where that Togekiss drop comes in very nicely. You get the nice ground immunity. You also get, uh, even though Nidoqueen and Togekiss are both weak to ice, Jirachi patches that up too. So I really like the mindset in those first uh, three picks. Jolteon is interesting because up until that pick, he didn't really have anything that fast, all kind of around average speed. Then he has something blazing fast, and then he has something incredibly strong with a wall breaker in Tyrantrum. Having used Tyrantrum before, it is definitely not something that uh, you should take for granted it's probably going to pick up at least a single KO every single match if it's used properly. Uh, after my whole snafu in Season 2 with Talonflame, I know that Talonflame is better left in the hands of others because I don't know how to use it in draft format. Uh, I'm pretty good with it in regular OU, but in draft, I don't use it very well for whatever reason. And so I was a little bit dismayed to see it here. Although it was interesting to see how much the value of Talonflame dropped since last season. We also see Hariyama and Gorgias going back to back here, which is interesting. Um, Hariyama just saps up so many of the weaknesses that Gorgias has, but they are both weak to flying, but he has plenty of other things to cover flying on this team. Um, and then Lightbart is similar to Jirachi, having the ability to perform several different roles. Most annoyingly, probably Copycat, being able to copycat something and then pop back into the battle and use it with increased priority with Prankster. Not to mention more U turn options. He can U turn. Or Volt Switch with Jirachi, uh, Togekiss gets Baton Pass, Jolteon gets Volt Switch, and Lightpar gets U Turn. So he has those options to retain momentum alongside Talonflame as well. And then somehow he kept Mega Blastoise all the way until the end. Um, not only does that give him his spinner, very important for his team, but that is a very, very hard Pokemon to switch into, even if you resist the move, just because Mega Launcher powers up the move so much. Um, so depending on the coverage, you can have a lot of things to deal with right there. Uh, with um, numbers 8 and 9, the Pittsburgh Pyroar, of course, coached by Slyro, uh, went with Mega Altaria on his first pick. Wow, that, again, the, the same trend of having your fairies in the first choices, but geez, having something like that in the first choice, I can definitely respect that. I consider doing that myself in the LBA. But here, 
we see Mega Altaria and Weavile, which I really like. Um, not only does that deny everyone else the option to Weavile, which is a great secondary check to Mega Altaria, but I think that allowed him to be a little bit more um, flexible with his other choices because he wouldn't have to worry about Weavile being used against him. Weavile shuts down Roserade, it can 2 KO Bronzong, it can 2 KO Kofagrigus, it can shut down Sandslash and Hydreigon. So if it's on his team, he doesn't have to worry about that, so I really like that pick. That being said, his other choices, uh, overall, there is not a weak link on his team. Um, and I don't think that there's really any weak links on other people's teams necessarily either, but I do think there are Pokemon that are much less likely to be used. And it's very, very possible that he could bring any of these Pokemon to every single week. That's how well this team is structured. Uh, not only do you see the uh, Fairy Steel, um, Fairy Steel kind of balance here with the Dragon for Hydragon, but you also see Fire, Water, and Grass, and then you also see the Electric and Ground um, type balance. So very well balanced drafting overall. I think I'm going to be most annoyed by um, Mega Altaria just looming in the back waiting to set up while I try to break down really, really defensive behemoths like Kofagrigus and Bronzong. Uh, but that's okay. You know, I think it's very doable. It's just a matter of trying to predict what he brings because it's gonna, with, with the way that he structured his draft, it's gonna be hard to make that prediction. Uh, number nine, uh, Onesie Bonnet with the AS Monferno, of course, first time in the uh, Division One. so congratulations once again. Uh, first pick, Victini. I don't need to say any more about picking Pixies in the first round. This is the first time in a while that I haven't seen a Fairy in the first three picks, though. And they're actually, his. he didn't get his Fairy until much later on. I'm surprised Whimsicott took that long to go. Uh, still picking three incredible powerhouses in the first three rounds. That's almost as much as you can spend in the first three rounds. Um, going 18, 19, and 17. This is probably the first time where I've been in a draft where I'm not worried about Mega Sableye, but that doesn't mean that it's any less of a threat. I just happen to have Pangoro, who can break Mega Sableye over its knee. Um, and I won't get a shot at Mega Sableye unless uh, I get through some of these other ridiculously powerful Pokemon he's drafted, like Zapdos. I actually was considering Zapdos from my draft, and then I saw that he drafted it. But um, So like kind of a miniature snipe right there. But uh, Escavalier was actually my backup to Caesar because I was considering going in the realm of Trick Room anyway. And so with Mega Sableye, Escavalier, and Marowak, uh, he could very, very possibly run some Trick Room shenanigans alongside Victini using V-Create to lower its speed and get faster in, in Trick Room. So we'll have to keep an eye out for that. Uh, Suicune and Regirock, I really like those for defensive picks because they are monotyped. And so that really lowers the amount of weaknesses that they have overall. I um, I don't think he'd use those two at the same time for most of the, the league because they do share weaknesses between grass. Um, but other than that, he has several grass weaken, uh, grass switches, excuse me, so he could very well do that. Um, we see another very efficient draft, which is last choice being Bayleaf. And if you guys haven't ever battled a Bayleaf, I actually have a battle on my channel where I had to battle a Bayleaf very very annoying. It gets not only the, a lot of the same supportive options as uh, Meganium, such as Aromatherapy, it gets Screams, it can use Body Slam to paralyze. So those are all annoying. But with Eviolite, it is incredibly bulky, and you really have to, to run some calcs on it to make sure you can 2 KO it, otherwise it will always get a synthesis off. Um, and that's pretty annoying overall. Uh, Kyurem and Sock can both be used as really powerful wall breakers. I think in a League format, they really shine because in, in regular overused, they get out class pretty easily. But um, I actually consider Kyurem for my own draft just because of the ability to spam Blizzard type moves. But uh, don't want to sleep on their wall breaking capabilities. And Sock is actually pretty fast too, with weird, uh, weird nice abilities such as Sturdy. So I want to keep an eye on those. We are moving into the last three choices here in the um, draft order with Under the Radar, Kelly. Um, with the Baltimore Braviaries, and he his first choice actually was Infernape, which I was really, really interested by. I don't think I've ever seen Infernape go in the very first round. Uh, and his goal, of course, was to get a fire type that not only was very versatile, but he wanted it to be relatively fast, too. So, of course, Infernape fits right into that. We do see a return to form with uh, in the first couple picks, including a fairy type with Azumarill. And between Infernape and Azumarill, we 
that covers so many different threats, similarly to what I was trying to do with Clefable and Caesar. You want to cover as much as you can in those first two picks. Uh, and with those two, not only does he have the options of different types of priority and support with Lead Infernape, but also he has the options of different ways to set up between Nasty Plot Infernape or Belly Drum Azumarill. Very, very annoying. Uh, with his next choice being Fortress, I did like that pick a lot. Um, it's annoying to go up against, but just the way when you're trying to structure your draft, Infernape and Azumarill are both... Neither of them like entry hazards at all. They're vulnerable to all three forms of entry hazards, and they're also vulnerable to every t type of weather, basically. So Fortress gets Overcoat, it can block weather, it can block spore type attacks, and also it can get rid of entry hazards, and it can allow a very slow Volt Switch to pivot into some, into Infernape, who's a little bit weaker. Fortress can take a hit, then Volt Switch out. Then suddenly you're staring down Infernape. I really like how that's set up. Uh, then we get into the point where I, um, I, I I do admit I took Slow King from him. That happened. But that is no excuse to draft three Regenerator Pokemon in a row. I love it and I hate it so much. Because he has Amoongus, Runiclus, and Alamomola. Yay for Palindromes. He can literally just switch between those three Pokemon almost all day and there's not much you can do about it. When you add in there Umbreon with Wish support and Baton Pass support, I, I don't know, I don't feel like I deserve having to battle that without something that has Toxic Spikes. But even if I had Toxic Spikes, it wouldn't help because he has Amoongus. So that's going to be a pain. Just going to go ahead and say it. That's going to be a pain to go up against, but proper preparation will allow me to prevail. But Jesus, that's, that's so good. That's so good and annoying. I hate it and I love it. Uh, Flygon, bringing up the rear there, kind of going back towards more offensive options. Alongside Mega Manectric. Once again, really surprised it took that long for Mega Manitra to be chosen. Um, probably because it's a little bit expensive. But even with that, um, so not only can, can he switch between all these different Pokemon, but he also gets access to a really good pivot and full switcher in Mega Manitric, using Intimidate to make it even harder to take out the Pokemon that he already has that are really, really bulky. So annoying. Uh, we're going to have to think of some strategies for that. But that's okay. Um, also, Persian, not to be slept on, it can run some weird special sets, and it has Fake Out and U-Turn support. Uh, and if Kelly's feeling really, really fly, he can use Payday and get some money in the middle of the battle. I wouldn't be mad. If he knocked out one of my Pokemon with Payday, I would not be mad about that. Uh, so that, highly, highly annoying, good draft, I would say. Very, mm, mm, It just makes me a little bit angsty looking at it, because I know when I battle it, I'm going to be angsty. But it's going to be a good battle, so I guess that's okay. You know, good battle at the end of the day. Um, then we have, of course, the travesty with the North Melbourne King of Scons. Uh, respect the pouch overall. Good draft. Powerful draft here. We have Latios and Excadrill in the first two. I was very... I, I almost drafted Tyranitar just so he couldn't have it. Um, but that wouldn't have helped my draft out at all. And I have made defensive drafts before. But getting extra drill that early on and then no one else wanted Tyranitar until that late in the drafting process was really, really surprising for me to see overall. Um, I do like Embor with Latias, Excadrill, and Embor. Um, those three perform... I'm trying to think of something that would wall all three of those. And off the top of my head, I can't really think of anything. Uh, and that... That having that that type of offense set up in your first three picks means you get a lot more flexibility with your defensive picks. Um, and that's probably why he went with Tangros and, and Mega Audino. Um, Mega Audino is one of those Pokemon that I think a lot of people don't really understand how to use. But once you properly understand how annoying Mega Audino can be, it makes it incredibly hard to break through. Plus, he has switch-ins for days for Mega Audino's weaknesses. And so as long as he breaks down his opponent's um, offensive attacks for Mega Audino, it'll be really easy for him to set it up. Um, we see support not only with Thunderous Eye, and then a secondary win condition with a Tyranitar Excadrill combination. Very, very annoying. Ah. And then he's the one who actually ended up getting Slowbro. Wasn't mad about that at all, because he got Slow King. So it will be the Slow Bros. The Slow, the, the slow King Bro Bros. The, never mind. We'll be the two people who have Slow King and Slowbro. There you are. Um, Quillfish is an interesting choice on the very, very end of his draft. 
uh, it gives him access to, of course, spikes and toxic spikes, which he didn't have anywhere else in his draft order, and an intimidate user, which is nice. Um, I think the most annoying thing about Quillfish overall is the fact that it gets randomly destiny bond. I, I feel like whenever I'm battling against it, I forget that it gets that, and then I it uses that, and then I knock it out, and then I, I lose whatever offensive Pokemon I thought was going to pick up an easy KO. So, not to be slept on here. Finally, last, RTK of the Portland Timbers, whom I have battled so many times. I wonder if he considers me a rival, because I definitely consider him one of my best rivals. Um, but then again, if I have a rival, you're a best rival. It's just fun to battle people over and over. Okay, what more can I say? You really get to see not only yourself grow as a strategist, but also that other person grow as either they continue to hate you and want you to lose, or when they beat you over and over again. I don't know. It's fun. This draft, not fun to face. Right in the first three picks, we have a fire, uh, water, grass core with Melodic Shaman and Rotom Heat. And you have to remember for this snake draft, each time RTK was getting to pick two Pokemon at a time. So his first two choices with Melodic and Shaman, uh, those could have been reversed as far as I'm concerned they are. We see the Pixie Pokemon in the first pick for him. So that was an ongoing threat for this entire uh, drafting process is just the pixie Pokemon. I want base 100 stats across the board. In Shaman's case, Mono Grass type is kind of meh as far as uh, offensive synergy goes, but Shaman gets some really, really nice coverage options that make it really annoying to be faced with. Um, and then right behind that, he got Rotom H and Dom Fan. So we picked up some um, fire support. Can also use electric moves. Will O Wisp is probably most annoying coming from. Um, Rotom H because even if I bounce it back, it doesn't burn it. So Zatu can't even switch in on it actually at all. So that's annoying. Uh, Don Fan, I did want Don Fan. Actually, he ended up sniping me on Don Fan and Gooch right now, and I'm thinking about it because Don Fan was definitely on my draft order. I think Don Fan was my original fourth pick if I'm remembering my drafting process properly. So he definitely sniped me there, but Don Fan Gudra, double snipes, not great. Not great, RTK. Don't appreciate it. I don't care how much it's so nice to have a nice, bulky, gooey, pivot-like Gudra that's also relatively versatile for you. Um, and actually, it fits in really nicely here. We see a lot of mono-type picks by him, which means he's cutting down on a lot of his weaknesses overall. Uh, of course, Mega Gardevoir was already chosen, so he went with Gardevoir, which I actually think he didn't want Mega Gardevoir, which I can't understand. Gardevoir... Just the regular form allows him to have access to a lot more versatile options such as Scarf or Bulky. He can run Trace and pick up a lot of different abilities from the opponent. Um, can be relatively annoying there. And with those last three picks, most surprisingly, Bisharp was his last pick. Almost blew my mind that uh, Bisharp lasted that long with as powerful as it is in a draft format. Scyther and Mandibuzz. I, I don't see Scyther very often, but Scyther is another one of those very powerful Pokemon that a lot of people don't use because they look at it and go, oh, Stealth Rot Weakness, and they don't use it. Here, the Stealth Rot Weakness is not an issue. Not only do we have Dolphin for spinning, but we also have uh, Mandy Buzz who can use Defog, so he'll probably get to use Scyther a good bit. In conjunction with um, Volt Switch from Rotom, U-Turn from Mandy Buzz, U-Turn from Scyther, He's going to have a lot of different ways to get it in and out of the battle uh, and just either pick up KOs or chip damage. You can also set up. It can use Eevee Light for a very Wokey Sword Chance set. Options, people. Options. RTK has them. And he doesn't even need to make a Pokemon. I, I always find it interesting. I'm actually trying this out in the LBA when someone doesn't draft a Mega Pokemon because normally you're only allowed one. And when you don't draft one, it really opens up your options as far as being versatile. So that's the draft. Our, um, I don't know, our team is looking very, very powerful for the first, I don't know if the schedule has been set up yet, so look forward to the first battle for this league in the next two weeks here or so. And if you have any questions, if you have any comments about the draft, be sure you leave them in the comments and I'll be happy to address them. In the meantime, guys, hope you have a great day and I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye now.